Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, so I'm chairing health geography at Edinburgh, and as Nisa has very kindly set up with interests around health and place, and particularly inequalities. Uh, I'm interested in the role in place of place over the life course, and how places throughout life uh, affect uh, healthy ageing uh, and inequalities in healthy ageing. Uh, and today, what we'd like to do, and I say we, I explain the we in the moment, um, is to talk about some really early findings from a new ESRC study uh, that got underway back in the back in the autumn. So you are, I'm afraid, um, our guinea pigs um, this afternoon um, sharing some early results. So of course, questions and comments always welcome with a talk, but never more so than today, where we're right at the start of this project. And we'd really uh, appreciate your your thoughts, advice, and ideas. That would be uh, uh, greatly appreciated. I'm going to be doing a double act, as I uh, alluded to there with my colleague Gergo Branyi, who um, you'll get to meet in a, in a few moments time. Um, Gergo is working um, as the postdoc on this project. So he's gonna tell us about some of the, um, some of the findings that uh, have been coming out over the last, uh, the last few weeks. So I thought good opportunity for you to meet Gergo at the same time. I should just apologize. I've got a very noisy three-year-old. We seem to be quiet at the moment in the background here. So if you hear shouting and crying, it's not me, I promise. It's, um, it's another member of the household. Um, so yeah, the context of this work is the what we might think of as the healthy aging agenda. I'm sure I don't really need to introduce the sort of the notion and concept of healthy aging to um, a, an audience from the CPC, but of course it's a as a WHA would define it, the process of developing and maintaining functional ability that enables well-being in older age. Um, there's much been much has been written about uh, uh, an aging population from a both an academic and a policy perspective, and I think it's widely agreed as being one of the global grand challenges. How do we um, how do we how do we as a society support uh, an aging uh, population? And how do we support a healthy aging population? Um, perhaps more recently, those of us working in this um, area uh, of health geography or place and space um, uh, are pleased to see there has been attention to the, the role of place in supporting healthy aging. How do we design places? How can places uh, be adapted to support uh, an aging population and, and indeed promote healthy aging? Um, but I think the, the, the perhaps obvious critique of the vast majority of this week work is that it's been very much uh, focused exclusively on uh, later life place-based factors. So those uh, contemporaneous exposures to place in late in life uh, and often how do we adapt places in later life for older people, often almost exclusively based on cross-sectional um, analyses. And it's pretty rare where, where geographers or people interested in the connections between health and place have thought about place-based factors, geographical circumstances uh, earlier in life and how, this, how these factors throughout our lives, place-based factors, the environments we live in through our life uh, affect healthy aging with some notable exceptions, which we'll perhaps mention later on. Colleagues around the country have been doing some great work on this. Um, and this sort of, um, oversight in terms of research, longitudinal work over the life course um, is particularly important when we're interested in diseases or health outcomes with long latencies, when exposure and onset may happen um, earlier in life, and or where there's a complex pathway between environment to behaviour to a response that may uh, become habitual. So there are, uh, I think, some good um, intellectual as well as policy reasons for, 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 for uh, working in this area. And so this is where, of course, this project that I'm about to say something about came from and where we've been organising, we've been using an organising framework that we have been calling and others have been calling the, the life course of place that I'll explain a bit more about in a moment. So what I want to do over the next 30 minutes or so is just to provide a brief overview of some of the work we've been doing in this area over the last two or three years or three or four years that's led, it, led to the current proposal and then to share some of the 
let's say, very early and hot off the press findings from um, the current ESRC study, and Gergo is going to talk about to, towards the end. Um, so that's that is the plan for today. And I could just start by going right back to basis basics uh, for uh, thinking about the connections between um, health and place. And as Nisa said, um, I edited a journal called Health and Place, which I recommend to everybody to um, to have a have a very regular browse through. Um, uh, and if we were to try and think about the sorts of work that we get coming into the journal uh, relatively uh, regularly, I think you could probably group it into two broad domains or two broad sets of themes that we get. The first one around what we might think about the op opportunity structures of places, the, 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 the attributes, the characteristics of places that um, provide the opportunity for good health. So some examples of this might be secure and non-hazardous employment, the quality of the housing in the neighborhood, uh, the local green spaces, um, other aspects of the physical environment, such as pollution and uh, or other hazardous um, uh, uh, pollutants, uh, uh, and, and the local public services that um, are available uh, in that community. The other broad domain that we um, we uh, might identify or can identify from the literature um, is what we might term the sort of collective social functioning and practices of places. So I guess these are the slightly less kind of tangible or, or physical aspects of places which are, are more are more subtle and, um, and have, have sort of, uh, varying, varying pathways into affecting health. So obvious ones might include the local norms and values in the place. You know, what's, what's a normalised activity? Is it a normalised activity to go out running in a early in the morning, is it a normalised activity to, to, to smoke or whatever um, outcome we're interested in. The local social capital networks, uh, the, the, the reputation of the neighbourhood or how stigmatised a neighbour is, or, or crime levels might be another example. So these are sorts of um, domains that I guess um, might be an, uh, a summary of the sorts of work that uh, people have focused on in terms of um, understanding connections between health and place. So what is what perhaps perhaps the next step is to think about you know, what are some of the issues you know what are some of the problems with the with a lot of the work that uh, we have coming into the journal or perhaps more generally in terms of the whole the whole field um, well I guess one of the one of the uh, key ones uh, in this area is that a lot of the work is cross-sectional often focus on uh, current exposures and there's a limited amount of longitudinal uh, work thinking about the connections between health and place and that matters for reasons we've we, we introduced a moment ago or when there is longitudinal work and uh, that, I've said that is increasingly the case of work coming into the journal it's usually over relatively short time frames so it might be an evaluation of an intervention following up for two three or for a lucky four or five years to understand how that particular intervention that place-based intervention has affected the health of people living in the vicinity or relatedly perhaps evaluating a natural experiment you know a new bus route that's gone in a new cycle lane um, and understanding how uh, that or, or broader natural experiments have, have impacted health but relatively short periods really re relatively short periods of evaluation and there's little work uh, very limited work um, internationally thinking about um, longer time frames and indeed thinking about the life course and, and of course learning from the the, the 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 large amount of work that's gone on in life course epidemiology or in uh, sociology uh, thinking about how factors um, are, are come together over the course of a, of a life of a lifespan to affect health often in later life and at the same time extor ignoring the kind of historical context in which people have lived their lives so what the kind of circumstances that people uh, faced in the earlier parts of their of their life. So that's probably a very uh, brief uh, and sort of high level critique of the work on health and place. So with, with that in mind, in terms of the sort of challenges, some of the major challenges for those of us interested in these questions, uh, those of us interested in the connections between health and place, what are some of the, the, the big challenges? And I guess perhaps to draw out two, perhaps two, two quite significant ones, hopefully, 
firstly, in terms of um, what we might think of as about exposure assessment, thinking about the, the way and the places in which we spend our time, the places we go to through our daily lives, or what's often termed in the literature, the activity spaces, and how that matters, uh, how, how characteristics of those activity spaces matter for our health. And I think we've seen a, uh, an exponential growth of research in this area over the last four or five years, people using um, tools and methods and data such as from GPS tracks to, to really understand um, how people use their environments and how those, those uh, much, uh, those, those better conceptualized, conceptualized aspects of place uh, affect a range of health outcomes. And then secondly, what I've been hinting at through um, this talk so far, what we might think of as a spatial life course epidemiology. So longitudinal analysis, over full life histories, thinking about how people and the places that they live in have changed over those over the duration and how people have moved between different places and how that matters to their health. Thinking about a wider set of um, exposures uh, and drawing perhaps on the notion of the exposome, i.e. the sort of totality of the environmental experience that uh, we face during our, during our lives. Uh, and the, the notion which I introduced at the start, that the frame we've been using around the life course of place. So that's my sort of by way of a bit of a background. Um, what I'd like to do now is just to turn to the specific um, project uh, that uh, that uh, Gergo and I have, and others, as you see here, have been uh, have been working on, including our colleagues um, in uh, psychology uh, and landscape architecture. Um, a, a project we've called the Life Course of Place: How Environments Throughout Life Can Support Healthy Aging, funded by the uh, ESRC. So the question we posed ourselves in, in this, at the start of this project was, firstly, can we develop a longer longitudinal approach to examine the connections between health and place across people's lives? So a lot of the challenges uh, in terms of uh, the, the questions, the, the, the critiques I've been making so far are largely um, a data issue. Actually, how do you put together a data set to answer some of those questions? It's certainly not a triple challenge to put together information, longitudinal data about people, the uh, demographics, social characteristics, the health characteristics. We of course have uh, various birth cohorts and, and uh, longitudinal studies in the UK where we're very much very blessed by those. But actually bringing that together with environmental information across time uh, is, is uh, as I say, not a trivial uh, task. So can we construct past urban environments to bring together the data we need to answer some of these questions? And if we can do that, can we ask then start to ask questions about are there accumulative effects of place? So are there aspects of places that accumulate through our lives to affect our health? Or, or and or are there particular critical periods in, in time? So obviously here, this audience will be straight away alert to the fact really what I'm drawing on here is the sort of, the sort of traditional life course epidemiology. Um, terminology and language and understanding and, 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 and trying to draw in and bring in a, a, a geographical place-based perspective to that. So yeah, as this diagram's rather clumsily trying to show here, you know, when we think about um, healthy aging, uh, we of course need to think about the, uh, the risk factors through life and accumulated individual level, but also some of the, ge the geographical drivers of, of this as well. So Perhaps just uh, just very briefly, I just wanted to, to uh, say something about more specifically about the life course of place, this this framework that I've mentioned a few times now, and why does it matter? Well, I guess really what we're hoping to do here is to uh, bring in um, some of the um, theory and ideas that have, that have formed in human geography over the last uh, twenty uh, years or so. Uh, and help and use this to help us in a in a more traditional epidemiological framework to, to understand these connections between health and place. So places, the geographers on this call will be well familiar with this. This is a bit of a Geography 101 lecture. The places, of course, are socially produced and dynamic. They change over time. They change um, uh, sometimes very over very quick periods. Other times they stay the same, and there's not much changes over the over uh, uh, relatively long time periods. Places are shaped by political processes and power relations. They reflect all sorts of macro level processes that accumulate over decades. 
Uh, and also we know, of course, from decades of research that environmental social differences are very closely connected. It's a bit of a false dualism to, to, to draw these things apart, as we often do in epidemiology. But of course, these, are, these things are very much, the environmental and social are very much intertwined. Yet at the same time, we know as geographers that local particularities matter. The, the, the things that are local, the things that are, play out in our local communities and neighbourhoods can mediate relationships through uh, the local resources that are there, the rules and practices in place and in turn reinforce and rework place-based characteristics. And that's, these are the sorts of ideas that um, our life course of place framework uh, and the work of others has been um, trying to um, trying to, to utilise. Um, and, and I think finally, by way of um, a background, w one of the ways in which we've been operationalising this, and, and some of the examples you'll see in a moment are uh, going to be focusing on green space. Um, it's not the only, as you'll see, it's not the only um, aspect of place that we've uh, been looking at, but it's certainly one of the, that's uh, particularly um, interested us over the last few, our last few years, and there's probably some quite good reasons for that. Uh, we know that green space is linked to a wide range of health outcomes, both physical and mental health. Uh, there are various pathways potentially through which green space can influence health, through higher green space areas having better air quality, potentially more physical activity of local residents. Uh, and what seems to play out more strongly in Scotland at least is, is um, uh, in terms of impacts on health is through pathways such as social cohesion um, and stress reduction. And we've seen, I think, probably the last five or six years in particular that the notion of supporting green space has been important to all sorts of policy developments, both locally here in the UK, but also internationally. And interestingly, I think, as some of the COVID discussions, the way in which um, uh, different communities have uh, managed to be resilient to some of the, the impacts of lockdown and interesting discussions about uh, uh, green space availability, access and quality being um, embedded in that. So onto the work we've been doing. So I just want to introduce um, a data set for those of you who aren't familiar with this that has been central to the work that we've been doing here. It's called the Lothian Birth Cohort 1936. So obviously this is a birth cohort of people who were born in uh, 1936 who are now the, the remainder, remainers are in uh, well into their uh, 80s. Uh, and what they all had in common is that they sat something called the, the mental survey test of uh, 1947. So when they were age 11, all children in Scotland um, sat this test and it asked all sorts of what looked quite difficult questions to me around uh, um, all sorts of kind of cognitive uh, testing of those children uh, and those um, records for all children in Scotland sat in a dusty cupboard at, in Edinburgh for uh, many, many decades um, and then got uh, uh, revitalised as part of the Lothian Birth Cohort. And what the Lothian Birth Cohort has done is to follow up um, uh, just over a thousand of the uh, 70,000 uh, children in Scotland at the time uh, and collected uh, a range of data from them from, uh, from around the age of 70. And there are a number of ways, indeed there's another wave that was in the field uh, last year. Uh, so there's gonna be a, a, a fifth wave uh, available very soon. And so we've got some very rich data on these participants from the age of 70. Uh, relating to also all sorts of aspects of their health, uh, uh, social characteristics, cognitive measurements, and many other things too, and also some information about them when they were when they were children, um, which of course, from our point of view, leaves a bit of a gap. We want to understand uh, aspects of place over the life course. So what we did um, a couple of years ago is we went back to all of the participants and we asked them to fill in what's known as a, a life grid. Um, it's a technique that's been reasonably widely uh, used to try and ex retrospectively extract, um, collect information from, uh, from, from participants. And, and, and basically what you do is you use um, triggers, uh, events in history to ask questions about them and, and what we were most particularly interested in or most relevant to the discussion today was asking them to recall information about where they lived 
at different uh, points in their time. And the aim was to try and collect some information for uh, where they lived every decade uh, throughout their lives. And that was um, proved to be you know, a reasonably successful process. Um, alongside that, we'd be, we, we spent a lot of time um, uh, collating, extracting and uh, searching, perhaps more particularly searching in terms of time commitment, um, a range of historical data uh, about the places uh, in which they lived. And I should have said that the Lothian birth cohort are all uh, residing in the Lothian uh, region of, of Scotland. And uh, we've um, been trying, therefore, to uh, collect this historical data for each decade, uh, information about the places, the environments in which they, um, they lived. And we've collected data on a range of things uh, from surveys such as the one you may be familiar with, the, the post-war um, civic survey that was undertaken in many urban areas of the UK, uh, contains all sorts of rich information about the, the living conditions, the environmental conditions, pollution and other things. Other reports such as the, the annual sanitary department, um, annual reports that are, are produced for Edinburgh and, and other Scottish cities, again, tells us some quite detailed information about particular neighbourhoods across the city. So we've been collecting a lot of information about the places that uh, the Lothian birth co cohort participants lived in. And here is one uh, example, a not very good map here, but this just give you a sense of being able to track, um, in this case, changes in public parks or green spaces across the city at different points in time. And the expansion, of course, partially uh, representing the growth, the outward growth of the city, particularly in the post-war period. Uh, but also showing there are parts of the city where the green spaces were urbanised and built over. Um, so it gives a sense of the kind of dynamics of the places and uh, uh, the changes in terms of green space availability in those communities. Um, uh, and we use green space and other measures, other geographical measures to uh, give a sense of um, the trajectories of exposure to different environmental measures of different participants. And that's what this, uh, is this a heat map? Is that is it what this diagram is called? Um, uh, that um, I think shows quite nicely, gra graphically quite nicely, um, how the environmental circumstances change at different points in time. You can see time along the bottom there. As I say, this is green space. And you can see that each of these lines represents a a participant or a sample of the participants in the Lothian birth cohort and you can see that at different phases in their lives they had rather different contexts in terms of um, green space exposure. Some had relatively high green space availability throughout their lives, others relatively low and in other, other cases it, it changed from high to low at different points in, in, their, in their lives. So it just gives a sort of flavour I guess of um, how those how those circumstances um, evolved um, through people's lives. And then in terms of our, the, the analysis that we did earlier, we, we did a number of things. I was going to show you a couple of examples here, a couple of green space examples, looking at the relationship between green space and um, mostly cognitive aging, and secondly, green space uh, and uh, mental health outcomes in later life. And we were asking the question of whether there was an accumulative effect of green space on these outcomes, or whether and or whether there were critical periods where green space um, seemed to matter in terms of those two health outcomes. And the findings that we've, um, we've published previously, so just have a quick look at those, green space and cognitive aging. Um, so what did we find? Well, for the first sort of main finding was that when we looked at um, the change in the cognitive test score in uh, between the ages of 11 and 70, so between they were young and before, just when they entered into the uh, the LBC data, there didn't seem to be any association. There didn't, was no evidence of anything really going on in terms of the relationship between green, with green space. But when we looked at the cognitive score as the participants began to age after the age of 70, um, there seemed to be a suggestion of a positive association and that perhaps more interestingly, that the, the childhood was a, seemed to be a particularly sensitive period affecting the trajectory of, the, of people's cognitive function uh, later in their lives. So childhood green space seemed to be related to um, the um, cognitive trajectory um, in, in older age, or between the ages of 70 and 76. Uh, this was enhanced by green space in adulthood, so it seemed to be a synergistic effect there. The effects that we found seemed to be strongest amongst women 
and from an inequalities perspective, interestingly, amongst those at low SES. And then just a second example before I hand over to um, or we'll, we'll introduce the work that Gergo has been doing. We've, we've been looking also, we also looked in some of the published work, looking at mental health in older age. Um, we used the HADS for those people familiar with, familiar with these measures, the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Um, and again, we did find some tentative evidence of a connection between green space and mental health. But very clearly, if there was one, it was limited to the most socially disadvantaged neighbourhoods. Um, uh, and the green space, again, green space during childhood seemed to be uh, particularly important. And then we also broke this down in, into particular um, specific uh, mental health outcomes. So looking at the anxiety domain of the HAD score, uh, again, seems to be mostly most socially disadvantaged neighbourhoods seem to benefit most from mental health in terms of um, uh, green space. Again, green space during childhood. Um, and we also found, whereas we didn't for any of the other analysis, there did seem to be some tentative evidence of an accumulative effect um, over the life course. So I've sort of run through some obviously quite a lot behind that, um, but just to give you a sort of a flavour of the sorts of work that we, we were doing in the build up to the current project. Um, so the next steps with this, this new study, um, as I've already kind of introduced, the overarching aim is to think about lifetime term exposure to green space, but also air pollution, area level deprivation, and look at um, various indicators of healthy aging. We're interested in this project uh, um, in using some biosocial data, so information on brain health, brain imaging data, uh, and also uh, indicators of biological aging. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And asking some similar questions to the work I've just been presenting. Are there particular critical periods or is there an impact of accumulation uh, over the life course? Um, and this is where I hand over to Gergo. I hope Gergo is ready to go and I'll move the slides on to you. He's going to introduce some of his early findings from this work. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, so as Jamie mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the moment. Um, at the uh, School of Geosciences, and I'm working in the CSRC funded project. And um, so in the very, we are at the very beginning at the, at the, of the project. So I will just show you the very preliminary re results for the first paper. So in this first paper, we were generally asking the question whether uh, neighborhood environments, they relate to frailty and old age. So what is frailty? So frailty is a general age related vulnerability, which increases the risk of injuries, disability, there also different kind of morbidity and mortality among uh, older adults. So this is a kind of decline to recover from different injuries from stressors and so on. So frailty has um, a multifactorial etiology and um, it uh, develops due to uh, loss of resilience in different uh, domains of functioning. Uh, next, please. Can you click next? Yeah, thank you. So, um, however, Research also shows that not all uh, people or no older, no older adults became frail. So in systematic reviews, there's also some suggestion that there might be a role of neighborhoods in frailty. However, the available literature is extremely limited. It's limited because majority of publications are cross-sectional. So there are very few longitudinal studies, especially in terms of repeated measurement of neighborhood. And the life course approach hasn't been properly applied in terms of uh, frailty and neighborhood. Next slide, please. So what we have done um, using the same sample, the Lothian birth cohort 36. So we defined three key developmental periods. So exposure in childhood and in young adulthood and middle to late adulthood. And we estimated uh, neighborhood deprivation in these developmental periods. So frailty, was measured with the frailty index. So there are a lot of different ways of measuring frailty, but we decided to use the, the frailty, sorry, frailty index, which uh, covers mainly declining three body systems in psychological system, cognitive and uh, physical. So here we captured this with items, for example, related to depression, but also to cognitive abilities. Um, so um, also to having chronic diseases, but also other um, measures were included, such as a grip strength and walking speed and so on. And frailty has been measured across, um, across all five waves, all five available waves of the Lothian birth cohorts, covering the age 
7282 uh, period. So what we did in terms of modeling, first we wanted to identify uh, the most appropriate life course model using a structured approach. Uh, can you click on the next, uh, please, Jamie? So, and on the right side, you can actually see how one can uh, operationalize uh, this structured approach. So what we did, we first um, uh, calculated or like set up a fitted uh, so-called saturated model, which includes all different ways how exposure for us here, uh, neighborhood deprivation might affect the outcome. And then we defined def uh, different um, life course models, such as the accumulation model, which Jamie already mentioned, also critical period models and so on. And we uh, compare the model fit between the different models and choose the model with the best uh, model fit in compared to the saturated model. And after the best model was chosen, we uh, conducted multi-level modeling adjusting for different uh, life course confounders. So next slide, please. And here you can actually see the, uh, the very preliminary results uh, on this analysis separately for male and for the female subsample because we assume that the effect might be different across uh, gender. So what we found in the male subsample is that uh, the best fit model is a so-called relaxed accumulation model. So it means that um, the effects of neighborhood deprivation accumulate over time. However, in a relaxed manner, it means that different exposure times are independently uh, affecting the, the outcome. In the uh, confounder adjusted models, we found that both childhood exposure to neighborhood deprivation and mid to late adulthood exposure were significantly related to frailty. In terms of the effect size, just to give you a little bit of understanding what, what do they mean. So uh, the frailty index is on a scale between zero and approximately 0.5. Uh, and if you compare these uh, effect sizes with other individual level um, indicators, effect sizes, they are comparable to the effect of um, education on frailty. So they are actually quite substantial. So we did the exact same analysis for the female subsample. Here, the best fit model was mid to late adulthood sensitive period. And again, um, it was significantly associated with, with frailty. Um, so next, please. And finally, what we also did, we try to um, understand whether there is also an association between exposure to neighborhood and decline in frailty or like increasing frailty over time. As I mentioned, we had a uh, uh, frailty measured in five consecutive waves between the age of 70 and 82 or three. And what we found there was actually a significant inter interaction between, uh, between age and uh, uh, neighborhood deprivation. So we found that, uh, that older adults, older female adults living in higher deprived neighborhoods, they decline actually faster in compared to those living in, uh, in the least deprived uh, neighborhoods. So just summarizing all these results, it clearly, it clearly shows that uh, neighborhood deprivation is linked to frailty. And uh, we have to consider actually uh, life course associations because um, because the effect of neighborhood deprivation might be also very long term on an age related decline. And also, it also has consequences for uh, healthy aging, healthy aging policies. Okay, thank you. And back to you, Jamie. Great. Thanks, Gergo. Um, so, yeah, I'll just bring, I think I'm just about out of time. So, I'll just sort of bring this together. Um, I'll just make a couple of quick concluding comments. But um, you know, hopefully, we've, we've, giving you a sense of this life course of place and why we think this is a interesting um, intellectual exercise, but also uh, potentially important from a, a policy perspective. Um, so we hope we'll, we manage to make so, some contributions to, to, to that literature. Um, um, and, and more broadly, I think some of the literature around uh, health inequ inequity, spatial, in spatial inequity and injustice um, and thinking about this, the, the some of the connections between historically embedded process and, and, and human lives, of course, in this case, in terms of in terms of health. So I hope there's a broader uh, social science meets um, public health contribution is what we're hoping. To say something about the uh, the important limitations here, some of the methodological uh, limitations. First of all, of course, there are issues around recall bias. 
um, particularly around some of our participants recalling back to past environments. Uh, there's a survivor bias, LBC, particularly some of the analysis we were doing with the, the latter waves. Uh, and it's also worth, uh, worth noting, though probably quite obvious, it's quite a low mo mobility population. These are people who have been within the Lothian region, or at least the east, eastern part of Scotland, uh, through most of their lives. Uh, and also in terms of, there's some data related issues relating to the availability of some of the things that we were trying to collect. Uh, we didn't manage to collect data, for example, on crime over time, or at least over a meaningful length of time. Uh, and there's also issues, I think, sort of how particular constructs, data constructs or, or data measures, the meaning of them changes over time, uh, as well as issues around some of the reporting units. But also, I think there are some conceptual issues, and I think there are also some quite interesting questions. Uh, despite what I said about thinking about life courses and life courses of place and being dynamic places, ultimately we're still uh, basis on a static set of snapshots of places, when of course places are churning, evolving over very different time frames. Uh, and there was, there was, if anyone's interested in a bit more about this, it was quite an interesting exchange with um, a colleague in um, in Canada, Gavin Andrews, who wrote a commentary around some of this work, uh, thinking about the need for greater methodological innovation to really understand the, this notion of life course of place. And then finally, in terms of next steps, uh, we've only shown you a snapshot of what we're planning here, but we certainly want to look at a broader set of environmental characteristics. We also un underway at the moment is looking at a, a series of biomarkers as outcome, cognitive aging through a battery of cognitive tests. As I indicated earlier, some of the brain imaging data, MRI data, indicators of change in uh, brain volume, et cetera, and some indicators of biological aging, telomere, telomere length and DNA methylation being um, some of the obvious ones. There are opportunities, I think, to scale some of this work up um, using national level cohort data, but comes with some further data challenges. Uh, and also we're, we're, we're part of a, a national, um, international network that's trying to think about whether we can um, roll out some of these questions and analyses in with cohorts in other international settings, which is something we're quite excited about. Uh, there's papers published on this. We're happy for you, happy to share this with you. If people are struggling to sleep, we can send you some stuff to read about some of the earlier work we did. But if I, if I could just quickly plug a meeting that's coming up, it was due to take place uh, in uh, just a few months time, but for obvious reasons, it's been postponed by year. And this is the Inter International Medical Geography Symposium, which um, as the name suggests, takes place in a different location around the world every uh, other year. Um, and we're really pleased to be bringing it to Edinburgh in what will now be June 2022 instead of June 2021. So if you're interested in any of this work or any other work around sort of the connections between health and place, this is definitely the meeting for you. So I hope you think about coming along to that next year.